Jordan. I can explain what he does for a day job. So, thanks very much for having me, guys. Um, this presentation, oh, I don't want to walk too much from the projector, um, is about Nemo. And um, Nemo is NASA's high fidelity training analog for the astronauts. And um, Nemo stands for NASA's Extreme Environment Mission Operations. Um, one of their best acronyms, as far as I was concerned, except they didn't come up with it. Um, so Nemo was actually taken from Captain Nemo, 20,000 leagues under the sea, uh, from Jules Verne. And this entire concept was to design and develop a training environment for astronauts that wasn't just a bubble or a habitat or a tent out in the middle of the desert or up in the Arctic Circle. One of the things that we found over the years is that these type of environments, oftentimes the astronauts would go, they'd work for the day, and they'd go to a hotel, they'd go to the tent, or you'd open the front door, or get out, and it almost destroyed the fidelity or the quality of the simulation. Years ago, the guy that came up with this concept was the chief trainer for the space shuttle simulator. So he had put several missions, probably up to about halfway through the space shuttle program, if not more, all of these through, through the space shuttle simulator. And he ran every case of worst case scenario that you could think of, trying to train these crews. And one of the things that he found is, no matter how bad it got in the simulator, at the end of the day, the astronauts went home. And he just felt that the level of fidelity and the level of training that these crews underwent, there was something missing. So he went and found Aquarius. Aquarius is the world's only underwater research laboratory. It's based down off the Florida Keys, about five miles off the coast on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, about 20 meters down, owned by Florida International University. At the moment, it's the world's only underwater research laboratory. There are or have been other smaller habitats, but at the moment, this is the world's only fully functioning laboratory. And the entire concept was the taking astronauts, putting them down into this habitat for one to two weeks at a time meant that at the end of the day, they were still in mission. There was nothing simulated about this. This was a real world mission that had a high off tempo that was designed to push the crews and deliver the best training environment possible before they went into space. So he went and contacted the chief medical officer for NASA um, at the time and tried to bring him down. And eventually, kind of after a lot of resistance, agreed to come down. And his basic attitude was we train astronauts, we send them into space, find the name of God, and we bring them down and put them underwater. But anyways, eventually he agreed to go down and he went with Bill and went to visit the Aquarius habitat. He went down and the only way to get down to the habitat is you bring them both out from the shore and you dive down scuba. And then you can go get into the wet porch, it's actually through moon pool, and you take off the scuba gear, climb up the steps and then into a dry environment. He was down there about about five, ten minutes and he was visibly irritated. And eventually, after about five to ten minutes, said, Okay, I've got it, let's go. So they went, put their gear back on, dove back out, back onto the boat, and he turned around to Bill. And he says, I get it. He says, I absolutely get it. He says, I couldn't stand being down there. I hated it. Hated every second that we were down there. And he absolutely changed his mind. He says, From now on, any astronaut that we have any kind of question mark over, he says, We're going to stick them in here before they go anywhere near space. And the entire idea was to put them in a steel tin can, a modified mini space station, on the sea floor, look at psychosocial elements, put them through a high off tempo mission, let them adapt to training, let them do experiments, let them do modified spacewalks, all of the components that would go into a mission and see how they respond. So at the moment what we do is we use this environment and this habitat as a training mechanism for the astronauts. And we do it in two ways. Generally, the two groups of astronauts that end up here is either newly minted astronauts that have had issues. Something didn't go optimally during the training environment. So the astronauts go through a two-year training process as astronaut candidates, so they may not have been great in the water. They may not have been able to adapt quickly enough. So this gives them the opportunity to go into a real-world mission scenario and raise that lower bar of training up a couple of notches before they actually go into space. The second group of astronauts are generally those that are experienced, they've already flown in space, they've proven themselves, and it's part of a commander upgrade program. 
So some of the astronauts are those getting ready, it's giving them leadership experience, leading a team in a mission environment before they actually go into space, and at the moment that will be to command the International Space Station. I was lucky enough this last summer, um, I've worked on this mission for the last six or seven years, as both a physician, as the diving medical officer, as a rescue diver, and as a scientist. And this last summer I got the opportunity to actually go down as an astronaut as part of the NEMO 21 crew. This was an incredible adventure that I got the chance to actually go live, work, and see alongside the astronauts, and actually be a part of that mission in a way that I hadn't previously, which was pretty phenomenal. So what I'm gonna do is just talk you through some aspects of the mission, and what this mission means, why it's important, some of the experiments that we did, some of the nuances, just some of the stories, and then kind of give you a chance to just ask questions about what we did and what's in store kind of for the rest of the program. Okay, that was the wrong button. No, that's really the wrong button. Okay. Don't let doctors touch computers. We're not allowed to press buttons. Um, okay, so we'll talk about a little bit about the background, a little bit about Aquarius, Nemo, the mission objectives, and then the highlights. So my background, um, I trained in medicine at UCD, um, but at heart, I'm a space cadet. All I ever wanted to do was go into space and behind closed doors, I'll admit it, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to walk on the moon. Um, I ended up in medicine and after a couple of years realized that if I really wanted to do this, if I really was going to pursue this seriously, I had to actually go and change the track that I was on. So in about 2003, the European Space Agency put out a call to all the medical schools in Europe looking for a fresh injection of ideas in four specific areas, not that they were having issues with, but wanted fresh blood as part of the mix. So I submitted an abstract that was based on using ECG, the electrical activity of the heart, um, that blip line that you see in the hospital, um, as a surrogate marker for sleep disruption and instability. So we weren't looking to go and replace what all the equipment that you would see in a sleep lab. So you've seen a sleep lab, you see kind of the sleep left with the wires coming out everywhere, you have the tube and a whole load of equipment that's just very cumbersome, it's also expensive and it's even more expensive to get it from here into orbit. An ECG is a readily accessible physiological parameter that is easily attained and can be used for so many other things in medicine that it just made sense that we may not be able to get all of the data like the stages of sleep but we're not looking for stages, we're looking for quality and disruption of sleep. So I wrote an abstract, it got selected, and I was flown with 30 other students from all over Europe to the European Astronaut Centre for a week. There we got to meet some of the European astronauts, some of the staff from the European Astronaut Centre, they had the head of life sciences over from NASA, and then the counterparts from Russia. I presented, and the head of life sciences from NASA pulled me aside afterwards, and he said, listen, we're looking at something similar to this. He says, NASA's working on a similar concept. I like what you're doing. Go flesh out this idea, expand on it. Go and make a presentation, write a white paper, go and present this at a couple of scientific conferences and let's see where it goes from here. So I followed the man's advice. Over the next couple of years, I did exactly that and then I ended up putting the experiment into this mass European Space Agency database. So every time one of the European astronauts flies, and there's a database of experiments that they're able to go in, select experiments from, and actually identify the experiments that they want that astronaut to fly in a particular mission. I was lucky enough that the experiment that I was doing, they needed a student experiment at the time, they liked the angle that I'd taken, they liked the background and the components, and through a series of kind of steps, it went and got selected, through shortlisting and so on. So the experiment goes and gets selected. At the time, I have a PowerPoint presentation, I have a white paper. Head of the program rings me, he says, congratulations, I already had a letter in hand saying, you've been selected, experiment's gonna fly in ISS. And I was like, fantastic, outstanding. And he says, now, I'm gonna ask you a serious question. He says, can you really do this? So, I took a minute, I paused, and being Irish, I turned around and said, absolutely, no question, we'll get this done. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so we're going to fly an experiment in space in 18 months. That's generally a five-year process. So they know I'm a student, and we're go working on an accelerated timeline. Of course, the European Space Agency is going to go and give me all of the resources that I would need to 
go and make this experiment happen. So I turned around to my university and then at this, this stage I transferred over to engineering in UL, gone to the university and said, well, we kind of need a letter. We can't really take your word for it that you're actually going to be flying an experiment in space. So I went back to the European Space Agency and said, listen, I need a letter just establishing bona fides for what we're doing here. And they were like, no problem. I was like, on letterhead, fancy letterhead, as flowery as you can make it. I was like, no problem. Came back with the letter. And the crux of the letter basically said that the European Space Agency will cover all the costs for this experiment from getting it on the rocket from Baikonur to the International Space Station. So I was like, that's great. What about all the costs up until that? What about all the developing costs? All the testing costs? All the transport costs to get this bloody thing both to America and to Russia because it was going in two separate vehicles? And they're like, well, that's up to you. So that started a pretty long process of finding equipment and then they came up with another zinger. So the equipment that we decided to use that I'll show you a little bit later on um, was a fitted life monitoring vest. So this was a fitted shirt with all of the instrumentation actually built into the vest itself so it wouldn't float off when the astronaut was sleeping in orbit and then a modified recorder for all the data that we were putting on to compact flashcards. The problem was they didn't want one as I thought initially. So they had, we needed a flight model. Then we needed a backup flight model just in case something happened to the flight model. Then we needed the model that was going to be tested for off-gassing. Then we needed the model that was going to be tested to destruction. Then we needed the model that the Russians needed as a backup to the backup just in case they needed something else to do with it. And then we needed another model for EM testing. So in total, rather than the one we were going to fly, we actually had to purchase six sets of equipment, all of which were 10,000 euro a pop. Yeah, exactly. Um, my heart sank. So to cut a long story short, my engineer was coming back from a conference in Austria, a space conference, and he happened to be sharing a taxi with a guy from Enterprise Ireland. And he was talking to me about the great project we were working on, we're trying to find funding, and the guy turns around and he's like, oh, I work with the Prodex Fund. He says, what you guys are doing, fantastic. He says, we need to get you guys funded. Fast forward two months, I mean 100,000 euro in funding from Enterprise Ireland and the ESA Prodex Fund, and that literally saved us. We were able to go get the equipment, fund all of the testing, all of the results that we needed. We needed specially made containers and everything else. So it went up, it flew. Tomas Ryder was the astronaut that flew it as part of the ESA Astrolab mission. And he went up on 121, came back on 116. And shortly before he came back in around October, and I was over in Britain and I met up with one of the flight surgeons from Kennedy Space Center. Talked to him about what we were doing. He's like, this is fantastic. The first Irish experiment on shuttle on ISS. Like, you, you need to be there. Would you like to see your experiment come back to the space shuttle? I was like, there's a bear shit in the woods. And he's like, well, we can sort this. So at this stage, I've been trying to get over to NASA and to Kennedy Space Center for years. But ever since 9-11, it's been so difficult to get the paperwork requirements and get past the security onto a federal installation. So you need some, to, know, to know somebody. So he went, signed all the paperwork and said, this is necessary for NASA's mission. They're coming over to support the space shuttle. And we ended up being at Kennedy Space Center on the 23rd of December, 2006, to see our experiment roll back on the space shuttle on the runway, which was pretty phenomenal. At this stage, I qualified as a physician. I'd also convinced Noah to train me as a diving medical officer. I was a scuba diver met with the team at Kennedy, both in the biomedical research lab, met with the team um, on the triage team. They're like, well, we like your background, we like your research. Do you want to come over for six months and spend some time with us and become part of the triage team? So I basically went home, walked into the emergency department and said, I quit. And the consultant was like, I don't blame you. And he turned around and he said, listen, he says, your job is here if you ever want it. He says, but I don't ever expect to see you again. So went over, got a badge, got in six months, turned into three years later. Um, I was lucky enough to support 15 launches and landings all the way to the end of the space shuttle program as part of the triage team. The team that we used to set up was on the very front line in front of the vehicle assembly building. We were the closest human beings to the launch when it occurred so that we could deploy if there was ever a contingency. Um, we had a Department of Defense medical team and a civilian medical team and uh, very close by they had Blackhawks with blades turning all the time so a really impressive footprint for fire rescue and medical just in case anything happened. 
Um, I was lucky enough that I became an expert in spinal injuries in the ACE suit. So that's what you can see up here. This is taken during a mode four drill. We used to run two significant emergency medical drills every year, a mode four and a mode eight. The worst case scenario for a launch and the worst case scenario for a landing. So the mode four was effectively, if something happened, if something exploded on the launch pad and you had astronauts on the pad with limbs hanging off, severe injuries, there was life and limb at risk. And the whole concept was they would deploy the emergency medical apparatus, they'd turn on the sprinklers on the pad, we'd send in a fire rescue team in these um, super cool garments with actually liquid oxygen in the tanks because of the risk of burning rocket fuel. We simulated, go down in the emergency baskets, from the pad to the bunkers, got carried off, let the emergency medical teams do their thing here. And I suppose a little bit strategically, um, I planned that I was the astronaut that had the very worst injuries. That if there was a decision to be made on a certain astronaut that had to be evacuated immediately, um, it was gonna be me. And it just so happened that that evacuation had to take place in a US Air Force Black Hawk helicopter to fly across Florida. Um, so, to say that was a good day would be an understatement. Um, so I was lucky enough to spend a significant amount of time in that ACE suit. The ACE suits were modified pressure suits from the U-2 spy plane that they went and upgraded over the years specifically for a space shuttle. So you had a cooling garment underneath that then locked into this kind of cooling bag that you carried around, a sealed suit that was all locked in together and then the suit itself actually connected into the space shuttle to connect all of the medical instrumentation that you had on board at the same time. Very cool. Um, they actually used to go and fly these suits in from the astronaut quarters in Johnson Space Center specifically for this. So when you got suited up, you had to be in astronaut crew quarters in Kennedy Space Center, which is a sealed locked floor of a building, and sat in the chairs that they would use specifically when they suited up to go out to the pad for a launch. So that was really cool. You got a little bit of behind the scenes of what they got to do and this was absolutely incredible. This is some of my favorite memories of the stuff that I got to do. Um, I was also lucky enough to get into Discovery um, and sit in the commander's chair on the stack. So you have the shuttle, you have the external fuel tank and then two solid rocket boosters on either side. Basically solids are there, tank is about to be fueled, shuttle is vertical and got to sit in the commander's chair just shortly before it went into orbit. So that was a pretty good day. I suppose another little bit of background, I qualified from UL with a doctorate in biomedical engineering. So trying to mix medicine with the technology component. My day job centers around the design and development of next generation medical equipment. Uh, we design fluid monitors that predict the fluid changes that could occur not only for space flight, but looking at changes for heart failure patients, dialysis patients. And we've developed the first generation of a small kind of tricorder like device, so better a credit card size monitor that is non-contact, non-invasive, that works on the basis of directing a single tone radio frequency into the chest. And based on a phenomena called RFII, radio frequency impedance interrogation, it has a resonant frequency coupling effect with a moving dipole molecule. So what we actually do is detect the return loss from a signal as it couples with moving dipole molecules, which in the body turns out to be hemoglobin, as blood is being pumped from the left ventricle, that big chamber in the heart, into the ascending aorta, that big large vessel. What happens then is that every time the heart pumps, like so, we get a blip from the change in return loss. That provides us with a cardiosynchronous waveform. We're then able to establish beat to beat intervals, which gives us heart rate. From that, you get the undulation of the waveform from impedance that as you breathe, the actual baseline of the signal begins to change. Then from that, the amplitude of the waveform actually provides us with a surrogate marker for how much blood is being pumped with an individual beat. Now this is important because it is application when you can't use electrodes, when you can't use gel in situations like space flight, pre-hospital care, in ambulances, any kind of extreme environment that you can think of, these types of devices have application, not only for missions like this, but for mass casualties, in hurricanes, where you have mass numbers of people and you only have one medic for every 10 people. How does that medic go and drop multiple medical devices? So we went and designed a system that would then allow the device to actually go and autonomously triage those patients based on universal standards of green, yellow, red, so he could go and actually treat the patient most acutely ill that had life-threatening injuries. 
the small devices that you see there are the small fluid monitors. What we actually did in this case is we modified those devices to actually be able to provide a predictive index for patients suffering from Ebola. So those patients that have been exposed to the virus but were not yet contagious. The way Ebola works is the virus goes and attacks the outer lining of the cells. And what happens is it dumps the water inside the cells, outside the cells. So we had a frequency shift in the way that we monitor fluid and we were actually able to graphically represent how that change occurred. And we were able to provide about a six hour window from a patient that went before they went from basically quarantine but stable to a contagious state and actually give the doctors a window of opportunity to actually put them into full quarantine, get fluids on board, antibiotics and so on. My night and weekend job, um, I teach and train combat medicine. I take Navy SEALs, Green Berets, Ranger teams and we deal in worst case scenarios. So these teams that deal in hostage rescue, counter-terrorism, I get them for 24, 48 hours after they've gone through the workup and we'll deal in a situation going into a hostage rescue. Then they get attacked. Team leader gets taken out. Then we take out the medic. And then they have to deal with these catastrophic injuries for 24, 48 hours before rescue team or before they can evacuate and learn how they manage these injuries in a field environment with what they have on their backs and still complete the mission. It puts a lot of stress on these teams, but the whole idea is to raise the lower bar of their training mechanism. On the space front, um, I'm the doctor for the bomber comet. So we get a plane, a modified 727, and fly it in a pattern in the air called parabolic flight. Once before we hit this curve, just the top of the curve, we take the engines and we reverse them. So rather than flying the plane over the top of the curve, the plane actually falls over the top of the curve carried by its momentum. So the plane is falling, everything in the plane is falling at the exact same rate, and then we get 20 seconds of weightlessness. Um, people wonder kind of about the plane, the injuries and so on. We've had everything from burst eardrums that I'll talk about in a second, but one of the biggest things is nausea. That inner ear, those semicircular canals in your ear that people get when they're motion sick or they're seasick, now imagine that all of the fluid in those ears and in those canals actually starts to flow. You have people that within two parabolas are literally turning green. They go into a diaphoretic sweat and they just simply can't handle it. And in microgravity, everything floats. I've been on planes, but once somebody starts to go, people around them start to go. And I've seen projectile vomiting go across a plane and they're only there for 20 seconds, and then it goes splat. So you're trying to go, and we pick people up that they're just so incapacitated that we're in microgravity kicks in, they're just curled up in a bowl. You take them up and you throw them down the plane. Somebody else is at the end, catch them, stick them into a seat, get a wet rag on, and hope they just stay where they are. Um, so, Last year, we were actually um, doing a flight in Florida, and we got to the apex of the problem, just as microgravity kicked in, and we had an emergency decompression. One of the seals in the plane went. So not only do you have people floating, suddenly this big cloud of fog comes rushing through the cabin. Suddenly, because the pilots see it, it's an emergency, they take that plane, engines back on, point that sucker down, and it's diving towards the ground. And I mean going fast. So we're getting people on O2, you girls screaming, people, four people have burst eardrums, and then you had all the stuff from microgravity that was floating just went whoosh, down to the ground. So that was a busy day. And um, that kept me, yeah, I, I, I had paperwork after that one. <laughs> then obviously the Nemo mission uh, that I got to do, so I'm, I'm an avid diver. Um, spare time to spend trying looking for sharks, big sharks, any sharks, sharks that bite. Um, preferably other people, but, and then this mission kind of was the culmination of all this stuff together. So what is Aquarius? Aquarius is the world's only one water research laboratory. You can see here on the right hand side, do I have a laser by any chance? No. No, no? okay, fingers it is. The back um, of the starboard side that you can see here down the very bottom, there's three bunks, one on top of the other. So very, very small living space. Beside that, you have a living area with a galley window, small table, that comfortably will sit two people, one on either side. Uncomfortably will sit four people. You're likely to get an elbow, unless somebody's very, very slight. You have all the life support systems there. You have a small kitchenette and sink, small workspaces. Moving into the science locker where we have um, screen set up, we have a science sink, some more life support equipment. That's where the main bulkhead of the habitat ends 
and then moving into that then is the wet porch where we keep all of the scuba gear, all of the dive helmets, all of the wetsuits and that's where the moon pool is located. So we try and keep a barrier between the wet and the dry just to make sure we're not carrying water into the rest of the habitat. You can see here the moon pool that we get in and out, so this is how we get in and out of the water. The air pressure inside Aquarius is kept just slightly higher than the water pressure outside. So the air pressure is actually continuously keeping the water out, so we don't actually have to go in and out through an airlock, we can actually just climb in and out of the water, which makes it really easy. You can see up here at the top in the middle, and the galley table, and then the large portal, so you can see the living space, so six people living and working in this space. You can see here the science locker, so all the life support and kind of gauges and equipment on one side and then that little bit of space and then looking back towards the little fridge on the left hand side here, then down into the bunks. So it's a mini space station on the sea floor. For six people to live and work, it's actually fine. And after a day I was like, oh, this feels like home. It was comfortable. It's comfortable if you get on with the other five people. It's comfortable if nobody's a pain in the ass. It's comfortable if that's all you're doing. However, we weren't just living there. We were working. One of the biggest things that we found was the conflict in the schedule of trying to conduct different types of science experiments and not take up all the real estate, not take up all the floor space. Trying to do multiple things at the same time, this space became very, very busy. And you'll see some of the stuff that we worked on in a little while. So this is just a good view of one of the aquanauts down underneath Aquarius. And you can see the habitat up on stilts, and then we had these 600 foot long umbilicals um, that connected us. So the Kirby Morgan hard hat had full audio and voice comm inside, so we can talk to and uh, back to the habitat. They can hear us and talk to us, and then it contained life support, so our air supply, and all of the comms went back. And um, this particular mission, the 600 foot long umbilicals that we use, were the longest ever, and it's the longest allowed by the United States Navy. And they don't actually go longer than that. We have a range of support divers um, and equipment available to us. So this one, the Aquanauts, just preparing to go down or go back up. But we have these scooters made available to us simply because we're traversing large distances with equipment to support the Aquanauts at any one time. So the, the divers, this is a good mission to dive on. So why Nemo? And we talked a little bit about this being a high fidelity or a high quality training environment. We talked a little bit about why it's important for the astronauts and for the leadership components, the stress that we put them on, the psychosocial interactions and team dynamics. It's much better to see a crew member have issues in an environment like this and have interpersonal issues with other crew members in this environment rather than in spaceflight. There have been issues over the years, now not many mind you because they're well screened, but to see somebody crack a little bit under pressure, under stress, in a high up tempo environment and has a very, very interesting but detrimental component to it uh, for missions like this. So there's a real good example on Mir where there were two cosmonauts, I think up there for about six months. For most of those six months, the two cosmonauts lived on opposite ends of the Mir space station, didn't see each other, didn't talk to each other, didn't interact with each other. And it caused some pretty significant problems, obviously, during the mission. But they just did not get along. They hated each other, was the bottom line of what occurred. We also get the opportunity to test new spaceflight hardware. So the EVA, or the Spacewalking Tools Department, is often heavily involved uh, with this mission of trying and testing their technologies. And then looking at spaceflight procedures. What works, what doesn't. What are we missing? Does this procedure work for spaceflight on certain pieces of equipment? Do we need to adapt or change it? Much easier to do that here, but it's great to get the feedback of high level operators like astronauts before you actually send them into space because then you get, you get one shot. Once it's up there, it's up and you can't change anything about it. The other opportunity is being able to do a significant amount of scientific research. Medical research is one of the areas that really benefits from interaction in this type of environment simply because of the level of data that we get back. One of the things that Nemo and the Aquarius habitat has been able to show over the years is that the immunological and physiological profile that we get from crew members as part of this mission almost mimics exactly the same profile that we got during a high-op tempo space shuttle mission. So immunology, levels of hormones, 
and cortisol. All of these different components that we look at in what's called biomarkers are mimicked on board Nemo very, very closely to what we found on spaceflight. That's one of the ways that we know that the stressors in the environment that we're exposing these crew members to are replicated so closely by this mission as it was on spaceflight and why it's so valuable. So analogs come in two flavors, environmental and mission. The environmental conditions are a little bit different with Nemo with the other habitats. So we have habitats up in the desert in Utah. We have habitats up on Devon Island in the Arctic and then we have mission the high seas that just finished out in Hawaii. The one thing all of those missions have in common really is that if you have a bad day, if you're pissed off, if you're angry or if there's an emergency you can walk out the front door. Nemo is different. When we go down after about 24 hours you are officially certified as an aquanaut. You are living under pressure at depth on the seafloor. It also means that your body is now completely saturated with nitrogen. It's called saturation diving. One of the biggest problems and risks with scuba divers is decompression sickness, or what we call the bends. Divers go down underwater for a significant period of time. When they come back up, they do a safety stop. If they stay down for too long, they actually go into decompression diving where they have to do scheduled stops. Take this to a whole new level. After 24 hours, all of the body's tissues at that depth are now completely saturated with nitrogen. The bones, the muscles, the soft tissue, the fat, everything else. If we were to go after those 24 hours from the seafloor back up to the surface, all of that nitrogen would expand in all of those tissues all at the one time and could cause a catastrophic incident of the bends or decompression sickness that could potentially be fatal. We could get bubbles that would travel to the brain, just in the joints, cause excruciating pain. So after those first 24 hours, what effectively happens is we must go through a 15 hour decompression or recompression to come from the seafloor back up to the surface. So what happens? At the end of the mission, we actually go and seal the bulkhead doors of the habitat and then we go and take it and we actually raise the pressure over 15 hours from the depth of the seafloor back up to the surface. The habitat doesn't move, it stays on the seafloor, but we actually raise the pressure. At the end of the 15 hours, we'll dive the habitat back down to its normal pressure, open the door, and then you have about a 15 minute window for those that are leaving to go get on your scuba gear and actually dive out back up to the surface. And so that gives you kind of an idea. The 15 hours is important because it's almost the exact same timeline that it takes that if you had an emergency contingency on board the International Space Station to get from hatch to ground. It's almost the exact same timeline, and that's why kind of this is so appealing. We also have the ability to go and do spacewalks or EVA on the seafloor. So every second day, two aquanauts are on the seafloor. We spend about seven or seven and a half hours traversing on the seafloor doing different types of experiments. And the lab and the layout of the habitat are similar to a node or a module for the International Space Station. We also have a highly structured timeline with the same constraints that you would see in a spaceflight mission. So during this mission, we actually bring in four or five different NASA centers. We've had teams in from Canada, from Japan, from not Russia yet, but the Europeans as well, with a big footprint. And this is treated like effectively a mini space mission with all of the constraints and all of the support necessary to make it happen. NEMO has both. So why NEMO? We talked a little bit about the training environment of getting astronauts ready for spaceflight. We talked a little bit about the testing of new technologies, procedures and so on. So at the moment, you heard in the last talk, we have one of the greatest constructions that mankind has ever put together. The greatest orbiting laboratory and going above us right now doing phenomenal research. That research station will probably be there until about 2028. But that's not the end goal. Nobody ever said I want to build a space station and stop. The end goal for most people, most space agencies that you would ever talk to is to get to Mars. Now one of the biggest problems is NASA has been talking about getting to Mars in the next 20 years for the last 60 years. So we can probably keep pushing that timeline out. But at the moment the date for going to Mars, for putting humans on Mars, is being talked about in around 2030. And now one of the biggest problems is political will, funding, kind of the political landscape. And if you have one president that wanted to go, the next guy probably isn't want to go to go because he's just he wants to change things. So the diagram that you have up on the top right hand corner 
is NASA's current vision of a journey to Mars. One of the big internal NASA jokes at the moment is the diagram goes all the way to Mars. The funding only goes halfway to Mars. <laughs> so what are you going to do? But we also have the private space industry, the commercial industry. Um, Elon Musk has this grand vision of getting people on Mars sometime in the mid-2020s using current technology. Um, I'd be hard pressed for her to find anybody that's really going to bet against Elon Musk. He's a modern day Tony Stark and really seems to accomplish so much when he puts his mind to it. Um, we also have the advent of new vehicles. At the moment we're reliant on the Russians, the Soyuz, to get our astronauts from ground up to space, which is kind of a hard pill to swallow. Soon we're going to have two commercial companies, we'll have Boeing and SpaceX, that are going to be providing their own capsules that will be made available and then we're also developing the Orion capsule. You have Red Dragon, the Red Dragon concept from SpaceX that they're hoping to send a mission to Mars. But we also have the commercial space industry. So I think we're really at a tipping point for space over the next couple of years that I think we're going to see a paradigm shift. We have the likes of Virgin Branson and Virgin Galactic. They're going to be taking tourists up to the very edge of space, just past that 100 mile marker and um, to be able to get up out of their seats, see the curvature of the earth, get out of their seats, float around. The only problem with that is what most people don't realize is it's gonna be for two and a half minutes. You're gonna pay a quarter of a million dollars for two and a half minutes of a nice view and floating around. So I would say stick me on the plane any day. Now you heard in the last talk, this one kind of took my thunder, but like we have some phenomenal photos that have been taken of Ireland from the International Space Station. So you can see Ireland from Space Station, but you can also see Space Station from Ireland. And so you have the orbital ground tracking software. So what you can see up here is the different tracks of ISS, some of the satellites, and, and the Soyuz when it docks, and then the different ground tracking stations. So you can see the massive footprint that the ground tracking stations in, in Russia and that they have. One of the only reasons that we can actually see um, the ISS in Ireland is because the Russians are involved. Had it just been the Americans like it was originally planned, the track would have been much more conservative just to spend as much time as possible flying over the United States. So we actually have the Russians to thank for that. Um, and when you actually watch it, it's literally, it takes about probably somewhere between five and seven minutes depending, but it's literally the brightest star in the sky that doesn't fade and just moves across the sky. It's actually on a clear night. It's a pretty spectacular sight to be able to see. So there's a variety of different software you can use. And um, Daniel talked about one. ISS Live is another good one. And um, they get an Android and iPhone where you can actually show the track and the video in a split screen at any one time with one of the external cameras. So NASA has done a significant amount of work over the years in preparation for either going back to the moon, which we think that the, current the next administration might actually pursue because there seems to be a great international inclination to go back to the moon. So all the work that was done with the Apollo missions. We have three rovers on Mars at the moment, Spirit, Curiosity, Opportunity, doing different types of work, different types of um, exploration, looking for a little green man, looking for water, whatever else. We've had 21 NEMO missions that have built up an extraordinary level um, of experience in this type of environment. Different types of research and technology studies, and then other analog programs. So there's Basalt, there's RISE, there's High Seas, there's HERA, there's all kinds of funky acronyms and names, but the bottom line is there's a wealth of experience that has been built up in these types of operations. So Scott Carpenter was the first um, astronaut, aquanaut, astronaut, whatever you want to call it, there's different abominations out there. He was one of the original Mercury 7, so really one of the original right stuff, and he was the second man, second American to orbit the Earth after John Glenn. Um, while he was still an astronaut, he was still active US Navy, he went and started diving and then pulled out of the astronaut corps and then ended up living in Sea Lab 2 for about 30 days. So he was the first guy to live both in space and underwater. As of now, in the last mission that we had, um, we've had Reed Wiseman and Megan Banken, who were my two commanders, became the 49th and 50th people to ever live in space and live underwater in a lifetime. So 50 people, it's not a small number, but it's a pretty exclusive group. So this is my crew. We had six aquanauts, 
and this is us just after diving down from the boat just before we went inside Aquarius for the first time and then we have our two habitat technicians. So at any one time there's four aquanauts inside the habitat, two habitat technicians that are there to look after the habitat, keep an eye on us, make sure we stay out of trouble, don't break anything and don't sink or flood the bloody thing all at the one time. Um, this is us again, we've come around the corner. So this is the goofy action shot that a group of astronauts wanted to do before they went into the habitat. You would not believe how hard it is to get six highly functioning people underwater to do an action pose all at the same time and not look like a bunch of idiots. Um, some of these are record holding divers, experienced astronauts, and we all look like morons. Um, the rest of the crew hates this photo, I love it because it just demonstrates how badly wrong a photo can go. So this is the crew. The top left hand corner on the boat before we went down, then Hank and Sean came out. So these two guys were interesting. Um, Sean was a young commercial diver that had screened as a Navy SEAL um, years previously. Hank is the US Navy's highest ranking master diver. He is the most experienced and most senior diver in the US Navy when he retired shortly before this and went to work on Aquarius. The crew up here, this is the very first day of the mission, everybody came down. This was kind of cool. The very first day of the mission, we actually got the opportunity to do a live link up with the International Space Station. So we had Jeff Williams and Kate Rubens on ISS, living in space. We had us down at Nemo 21, living under the sea, doing a live link up. So we got about a 30 minute link up through Mission Control in Johnson and we got a guided tour of the International Space Station with Kate who had just arrived a week previously. So she's not experienced, she still hasn't adapted to flying in orbit, so she's banging around, bumping into the walls, trying to hold the laptop, do selfies all at the same time, and it's hilarious. One of the good things is we had met Kate previously at Johnson Space Center and just before she left to go back to Russia, and then she had also been a Nemo crew member years previously. Um, so she knew what we were doing, knew the excitement level and everything else, which was pretty cool. The bottom right hand corner here, you have Megan Benkin on the left, Reed Wiseman on the right. Megan Benkin was an oceanographer who actually went and defended her PhD while she was an astronaut. She got a lucky set of coincidences that actually allowed her to qualify as an astronaut while she was still a student, which is very unusual. Um, but she was one of the astronauts on board STS-125. She was actually the astronaut that was the robotic arm specialist that retrieved the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which was a pretty extraordinary mission in its own right. Then Reed Wiseman was part of Expedition 4041, who um, was on space station for six months, um, about a year and a half, two years ago. The guy in the middle is Chris Cassidy. Um, he's a former Navy SEAL. He flew in the space shuttle, and he flew on the International Space Station. I hate this guy. This guy is the epitome of a modern day, effectively James Bond is what his crew members called him. When he got a call to be an astronaut, he was leading teams in the mountains of Tora Bora chasing the Taliban. And his commander got the call and said, hey, you're gonna be an astronaut. He says, I don't have time for that, I'm chasing Taliban. And basically disappeared back into the mountain. I was like, <laughs> so he's cool. Um, an extraordinary background, great guy. And just before this, he had just taken over as the new head of the astronaut office, actually. So what did we do to prepare? And we had months of experiment preparation for this mission. We had a range of 20 to 30 different experiments, a lot of them human related, so they required um, IRB consent. And um, so a lot of time and effort was put into that. Then we actually got the opportunity to go and train and do about a week to 10 days worth of training with the astronaut at Johnson Space Center. So we got exposed to some of the experiments, but one of the best days that we had was towards the end of the week where we had to do a swim test. Now, at Johnson Space Center, there's only one pool that's available to do a swim test in. That pool is called the MBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. The Neutral Buoyancy Lab is one of the world's largest swimming pools. It's about four stories deep, and it has a full-scale mock-up of the International Space Station actually sunken down into the water. So we ended up doing a swim test, getting ready for Nemo while swimming over and back 500 meters across this gigantic mock-up of the International Space Station in water that was literally crystal clear. It is the slowest swim test in history, I can guarantee. Nobody touched the wall like literally within seconds of the allowable time because we didn't want to get out of the water. And this is 
photo taken with Paolo Lasvali, um, who is the European astronaut. And we actually have a launch going on tonight, so tomorrow's the best quick. Um, anyway, it's French, not tomorrow. And Peggy Whitson, the US astronaut, are actually, actually, actually just, launched. just launched. Yeah, they're going to launch at 8.20 tonight. And then Paolo is actually in the back of 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 the
and I went and I not panicked but I was anxious and I went and got onto my knees literally as quickly as possible went turned the valves got that and I was relieved to have that flat helmet um, empty and it was very significant it was one of the only times that I've really had a level of anxiety during training and I didn't want to repeat it I thought I'd be fine but I was like yep yeah, once is enough in that one um, and it was a lesson learned some of the other training that we did on the sea floor was learning how to use some of the navigation equipment that we have we get a lot of stuff from the US Navy this um, device actually allowed us to traverse different waypoints that I show you in a little bit on the sea floor out from the habitat to different points in the coral reef mimicking how you would go and actually lay out some of these waypoints during a mission I am um, I talked a little bit about topside support we had four different NASA centers bringing in an entire footprint that supported mission control we had CAPCOMs come in from mission control from Johnson and the European Space Agency and comms come in from KSC and a full internal network that allows us to communicate directly with the habitat, with the aquanauts, and transfer everything we needed back to the core NASA centers. This tool is called Playbook, and was actually one of the most interesting components of this. On station, they have a tool called Optimus. Optimus takes an individual astronaut's timeline and breaks it down over the course of days and weeks, and it gave basically a field of all the tasks he has to do. Optimus goes and calculates um, inconsistencies in the timeline for activities that need to occur simultaneously with the rest of the space station. So the certain things that need to happen before a docking, the certain things that can't happen during a docking, the certain things that they need to do before, during and after a spacewalk, Optimus goes and calculates all of those. This mission uses playbook because we have multiple crew members that need to work in tandem. We're not sitting down in the water looking at the fish all day long. Your individual day is literally scheduled from morning till night in five minute increments. And then you have this thin red line that's moving consistently all the way throughout the day. If that thin red line moves over an activity and you haven't completed it, the activity turns red. And you would not believe the level of stress to see that little red line move along your day and multiple red boxes appearing because you haven't completed it. Then the white space that you were going to use to actually eat your dinner at the end of the day or when bedtime came, you're still working. You have multiple teams, 20 to 30, depending on you to go and complete those scientific objectives. They spent the last year preparing for this mission and you're the operator. Trying to go and make sure, and it may not be your fault, it might be the blue screen of that with windows. The software may not work. Somebody may not have actually gone through the bloody procedure correctly, topside. A good example would be when I show you the um, coral tree farm or the coral nursery that we built, the group topside were using PVC to build it. They hadn't actually gone and drilled the holes and gotten the little bits of PVC out before we took it down underwater. So we actually had to go manually each time and drill out the hole of PVC underwater, which just added a phenomenal amount of time to the task that we needed to do and literally screwed our entire timeline. We have an excellent platform of support divers that support us and tend to us underwater to make sure that we're safe. Tend the umbilicals that we're carrying behind us to make sure that they stay above the coral reef and then bring down the tools so that they'll set up our tools and everything that we need for a day's diving from the boats in the morning, bring it back up at night time, retool it that night and then rehash the next day. So a really good group. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the internal objectives some of the science that we did on the inside, as I said, we had about 20, 30 different experiments and then some of the stuff on the outside. So this is our EVA console, um, EVA spacewalking. When you do a spacewalk outside the space station, there's always an astronaut sitting in mission control on comms with the astronaut, talking them through the procedure. Okay, step 241, now 242. Put your hand here, okay, this tool, okay, beware of this, providing constant feedback for all of the training and mechanisms that they did. One of the big things that we did on this mission is we operated for the latter half of the mission under a time delay. If we go to Mars, we are not going to have real-time comms. So we simulated 15 minutes for comms to get from the habitat back to Earth. This was a simulated mission to Mars, and then 15 minutes back, so a 30 minute comm delay. So you had all of these screens, ranging from the messaging tool back to mission control, the real-time location analysis of the aquanauts, the two video feeds, different types of data, then in the bottom right hand corner, you had data presenting life support. 
So one of the biggest things for a spacewalk is not the work capacity of the astronaut, it's actually your life support. How much O2 do you have left? How much CO2 have you built up? Can you last longer with the limited supplies that you have? They went and actually spent time designing software to put up false um, readings to make sure that you're always scanning this area at any one time. So you can imagine that for seven and a half hours, you're sitting here monitoring all of these screens, taking the science notes, communicating with science, communicating with the mini mission control, relaying that all back to the aquanauts and making sure all the procedures and all the goals are being met for that day. This was my drinking from a fire hose moment. The astronauts that sit in mission control and that have flown are already familiar with this setup. They know what they're doing. They know how they're doing it. Here you see we sitting with the HoloLens goggles that we brought down with us, providing additional procedures, feedback and just in time training for some of the components that he was doing. So you have aquanauts on the seafloor that have flown in space before, very experienced. You have a 40, 50 person mission control back on the shore, Capcoms that oftentimes sit with the astronauts, engineers that know exactly what they're doing, and you. You're the one guy that talks to everybody and for seven and a half hours, you get a flood of information that you're trying to make sure that you're not the one guy that screws up. Because if you miss a beat here, everything starts to deteriorate afterwards. The timeline slips and the objectives get missed. When I got up from this the first time, I was absolutely mentally exhausted. The same day that I did that, uh, Megan Benkin, who was my crew member uh, for diving in EVA, she came over one day because she's doing a completely separate experiment. She's a seven hours worth of DNA processing to do. She comes over, taps me on the shoulder, says, how are you doing, Mark? She didn't even wait to see, to get the answer. She just walked away. So I was literally left to my own devices and this was grueling but one of the best learning experiences I'd ever had. We then tried it with two people actually later on in the week to see could one person handle all the workload and just how much benefit was it to have two crew members doing this work at the same time. DNA sequencing. This was the first time that DNA had ever been sequenced underwater. Every crew member did it, it was about a seven hour process. You had 40 pages worth of procedures. You had 30 different reagents, some frozen, some at room temperature, and this was a very finicky, delicate procedure. One of the reasons that this was important is that we were actually fine-tuning the procedure that Kate Rubens was actually going to use on the International Space Station about six weeks later. So I was the first guy to do this, so I was very conscious of getting this right. So I'm three hours into the procedure. I'd gone and gotten the mini PCR, the polymerase chain reaction machine, ready to go and take the samples. I prepped everything, I'd been very diligent. And this little mini PCR machine that's at my left hand, you go and take that, you plug it into the computer, you put the reagents in, and you start the software. Did all of that, software started, computer's going, I'm like, great. Mission control, mini PCR machine, working away, I can see the screen. About an hour later, I get a message. And it says, Mark, did you turn on the mini PCR machine? I was like, well, funny enough, I don't actually remember turning on the machine. And I went over and on the back, there's a little black button that says on and off, and lo and behold, the button's off. So, damn it. There's three hours of work literally down. I was like, can we go? Can we turn this on now? And they're like, no, the sample needs to go back up on the last boat that's going this evening. We've just lost almost an hour and a half. It's not gonna work. The reason they went and sent that message is the people that had designed the experiment went back and looked at their own procedure. I had been so diligent in going through this procedure and I went back through it and lo and behold, what step was missing? Turn on the bloody PCR machine. They'd actually written the procedure and forgotten to fill in the step of turn on the machine, which turned out to be a massive fault on theirs. So my commanders pulled me aside and listen, it's not your fault. You followed the procedure exactly as it was laid out. You are not expected to step outside this procedure and do anything else. So I followed the procedure, but common sense had gone out the window. But they actually went and changed the procedure and made sure they had double checked it before they give it to Kate Norbert. Because if she had gone and done the same thing, the experiment would have been screwed and she literally would have lost um, half a day's work just trying to get this underway. So that was a learning experience as well. Um, this is Megan doing the exact same thing. So you have these little mini cartridges here that were very, very finicky. Um, and plugging it into this mini ion DNA sequencer. But the cartridge that you can see there was so prone that 
any tiny little drop of air that was introduced to that when you were pipetting liquid was going to screw up the entire analysis. Um, so it was just so prone and we were wondering, we actually asked them to go and simplify the entire setup for Kate because we just felt it was too complicated for her trying to float around and actually do the fine movements that were going to be necessary. One of the biggest issues with space flight is the problems that we encounter due to microgravity. Muscle, atrophy, bone density loss are some serious issues. So the astronauts on the International Space Station at any one time must exercise for two and a half hours every single day. But on ISS, they have these massive racks for basically lifting weights. They have a treadmill that they can run on. We are not going to be able to provide that level of equipment and just don't have the space in a little tiny capsule that's going to be going basically to Moon or possibly onto Mars. So what do we do? We need to be able to modify that. So this is MED2, a miniature exercise device. Um, so you can see the size of it here. It's not very big, but it's bloody heavy. It has software and it has a series of servo motors inside that can basically change it from an aerobic to a resistive machine. So at the flick of a switch you can basically go to a rowing machine to a machine that will provide resistance where we can do deadlifts, we could do squats and so on. In theory it sounds great, in reality this was a royal pain in the ass. This thing did not work accordingly, you had to go, you had to provide thresholds, you had to personalize it and we spent more hours screwing around with this trying to get it to work. I think at the end it worked a whole lot better, but the whole concept that I talked about, the thin red line and moving and not getting stuff completed, this was one of those experiments that caused the entire timeline uh, to shift in the wrong direction. One of the other things that we did is testing the EVA swap tool. So one of the biggest things is what happens when we send a vehicle beyond low earth orbit and it gets exposed to something on the outside. How do we go and sample it? How do we go and find out what it is? How do we go and take those samples, retrieve them correctly? So we went and tested just a brand new um, swabbing tool. We didn't do it on the outside, we did it on the inside, took a series of swabs, just locked it back up and then sent it back to Johnson Space Center to let them actually sequence and test the swabs and see what level and see what they actually found and see did it actually work. HoloLens. This was one of the more interesting applicable things that we actually got to do and also one of the most entertaining. So the HoloLens is Microsoft's brand new 3D holographic um, goggle concept. You go and put on the HoloLens, turn around and it will go and map in 3D the entire room before you. You can go and throw up the window screens right in front of you and actually go and take them. So you can go and take your word processing screen and put it over here. You can go and take your control panel screen and put it over here. If you turn, if you've attached it to either wall virtually, it'll actually stay there in real time. Space Station is huge. It's been up there now for almost 20 years with different crews, all bringing up different materials. We've had different stowage, we've had the progress, we've had shuttle, everything. It is packed full of stuff that nobody knows where it is. We have nodes, we have modules that are like three, four canisters deep. One of the biggest things is trying to find anything is just a huge time waster. So one of the things that we're trying to do with HoloLens is figure out a mechanism of barcoding everything that we can and then linking that into the HoloLens so you can fly through space station looking for something in particular. It will tell you where it is, where it's been, where it's supposed to go and any other details and directions that you need to actually go and find it. It's great in concept. We went and tried practicing this concept, getting it ready for space station and putting away these blue Nomex boxes in different areas in the habitat. The problem was that when you get to a window, it actually reflects the 3D holographic screen that you're trying to work on. When you have two people wearing a HoloLens at the same time, it'll actually go and mix up the two screens as you're trying to work amongst each other. So this actually became very, very frustrating for the crew. So Reed Wiseman is a bit of a wild card, and he's a joker, and he doesn't like doing things that he thinks are a waste of time. So one of the things that Reed did was before we went down, and he went and smuggled down a box of Lucky Charms. And according to him, the token leprechaun on the mission must have a box of Lucky Charms and they were sitting on my bunk by the time we actually went down. So it became a running joke actually doing this experiment that <laughs> we have several photos of this experiment being done. We have four good photos actually in fact. 
there are 40 different photos of using the HoloLens to stow the Lucky Charms in every single area of the habitat that you can imagine. Because they did it as a laugh, because it wasn't working. NASA became extremely irritated because you can't go and put pictures of astronauts stowing Lucky Charms on a mission all over the internet. It just doesn't work. And so I actually got heat for that even though it wasn't my fault, I hadn't brought them down or anything else. Last year we actually used the same goggles for just-in-time training for doing advanced medical procedures, for using an ultrasound and some other medical equipment. So we're still looking at the adaptability of this type of technology. Mobile PV was another technology set that we were using for just-in-time training. So you can see here that you had the wrist-mounted display, you had the larger tablet and the smaller tablet, all providing you with the ability of these detailed procedures and then you have the ability to go and call somebody in mission control through the little camera. You can see them, they can see you, and you would actually go through the procedure with that just-in-time component and also health help. So the first version of this technology is currently being used on station. It sounds great in concept, um, but all of these three devices were supposed to link at any one time. You were supposed to be able to call up a video on one, do the procedure on another, flick backwards and forwards between the two, jump up to somewhere else and tell it what to do. And for anybody that uses a smartphone, which is everybody, it just doesn't work like that. Um, so this became a royal pain. And they are working on it. It is being done on station. Um, so we'll see where that goes. This was Casper. This is the experiment that we flew on station a number of years ago, the sleep experiment. Um, so you can see the fitted vest um, with a small dado recorder in the pocket. Went up on STS-121, back of 116, the Astrolab Press, and then the Casper Mission Batch. You can see here that this is a breakdown of the night's sleep, and the entire component was astronauts suffer um, sleep disruption. The excitement of launch, high stress levels, the high off tempo, 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every day, microgravity. The rising sun is a zeitgeber. It is the number one in training factor to make sure that everybody can live and work in a 24-hour day. That means that the rising sun resets our body clocks to a 24-hour rhythm. That's why people living in mines, people living in the Arctic Circle, after a while begin to develop issues. First-time astronauts do seem to have significant issues with their sleep patterns, so we give them artificial melatonin. Every astronaut tries out a variety of different combinations of sleeping tablets to see what works best for them to make sure that they're not zonked and if they have to get up during the night, respond to an emergency and um, that the medication hasn't basically dulled their edge. This spectrogram gives the ability to actually map the quality of a night's sleep and actually detect any interruption in that quality throughout the night or look at any kind of intervention that we might employ. The biggest causes of sleep disruption that we saw during shuttle were changes in noise, vibration, and temperature. This spectrogram gives us the ability to actually go and align this with a mission log or with the environmental log and see if a crew member had a bad night's sleep, did it actually go and relate to a change in environmental conditions. We've also gone and adapted this technology into a wearable small sleep monitor that can be used in domestic medicine for patients with sleep apnea that don't want to go into a sleep lab that can actually be used at home. One of the other significant areas that we do a lot of work in is telemedicine. Trying to detect changes in crew members and monitor their health status from the shoreline by a physician or a flight surgeon and, and then taking this technology, not only applying it to space flight, but looking at application of this technology for increasing access to care for conventional medicine. Looking at people living in remote areas, trying to find ways to keep patients at home, monitor them at home, stop them going into emergency departments and not ending up in hospitals unnecessarily. So this is one of the key areas and one of the areas that I work in on a daily basis. We did a lot of work in what I call telomere degradation and epigenetics. So this was pretty interesting. Um, and it follows on from some of the work that we did um, with the group that did similar research on the International Space Station. When you have cells in the body, cells divide. Uh, and built into the chromosomes in the cells, the cap on the end of the chromosome is called a telomere. Every time the cell divides, that cap gets a little bit smaller, up until it becomes basically a nub end on the end of the chromosome. When that cap gets down to a nub end, rather than dividing, the cell goes into what's called apoptosis. The cell effectively dies. This leads to cellular aging. This is the aging process. 
Now this is implications for not only aging, but a lot of other diseases. Um, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy in children. One of the other big components of this is, if we send crew out beyond low Earth orbit on a three year mission to Mars, nine months there, nine months to get back, they will be exposed to potentially extremely high levels of cosmic radiation. It is hypothesized that the damage that could occur on a genetic level and two telomeres as well could lead to extremely severe sequelae later on when those astronauts come back if they ever came back. That's not a risk that we're willing to take with these crew members. We want to get them as healthy as possible before they go, when they're away and when they come back all at the same time. So what we went and did was monitored the telomere length before, during and after this particular mission and then we've also pioneered a concept of introducing a Trojan horse molecule into human DNA that will actually go and regrow the telomere length. We're looking at this for application to space flight and also looking at application for the likes of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Epigenetics looks at the change in the expression of gene and the genetic code due to exposure to an environment rather than actually changing the code itself. So we did a lot of work in these areas. The Jedi mind trick one was when you mention genetics to NASA in relation to astronauts, they lose their minds. So it actually took us months and months and months of just trying to convince the IRB at Johnson Space Center that we're not actually altering astronaut DNA, we're not taking their DNA, we're not splicing it or anything else, we're just looking at the changes, but you think for a smart organization, um, they'd have a little bit more common sense. Peace out. Working in conjunction with John Hopkins, we looked at changes in the inner ear and vestibular function. And then a mission, two missions ago, we did a significant amount of work with the Raven um, robotic surgical unit where we actually took a team in Duke University, implemented a three second delay, and they did different surgical techniques underwater, basically mimicking the requirements of what would be necessary to do robotic surgery on a mission in space if the need ever arose. So we talked a little bit about saturation diving, the risks involved in this type of habitat. We talked a little bit about the 15 hour kind of recompression necessary. So this is the bunk area. You can see the sick astronauts in their bunks and then for 15 hours we went on and off an O2 protocol to bring us back up to the surface and bleed all of that nitrogen out of the tissues. But what are the other risks? You have the risk of trauma. So if you get a tiny nick or a cut um, down in this humid, hot kind of environment, there's bugs everywhere. The ability for those bugs to get in, the risk of infection is actually very severe. Trauma. If somebody breaks a leg or breaks a limb down there, or even anything, even something more mundane than that, it's very hard to treat. And then obviously you can't bring them back up to the surface. Uh, the psychological component. Putting six alpha hard charging personalities down into a little tin can on the seafloor in a high up tempo mission is bound to cause some kind of friction. We were lucky in that I had a great crew. There wasn't one bad day, one bad moment amongst any of this. Marine life, during the mission, we had five bull sharks that appeared after about, I think, three days. At night time, they'd literally be right in front of your face in the window, basically chewing on fish. One of them was about 12 feet long. One of the days during the mission, when I was actually up and I was a rescue diver, we actually had one of the large bull sharks actually go and buzz one of the aquanauts underwater and we actually had to pull them in off the sea floor because we thought he was getting a little bit friendly and just in case he wanted to just have a taste. So we talk a little bit about the exterior objectives. So we talked a little bit about getting in and out through the moon pool. So you can see here, um, I'm getting out, you jump down from platform to platform. As you climbed out, you had a minimal amount of weight on. So from this here, all you needed to do was sink, even if it was slowly. So you could literally jump from platform to platform and could jump five meters into the air um, underwater without any kind of problem whatsoever. It was fantastic. You go down and jump from this platform down onto the ground and then we'd go and do the proper way out with about 40 pounds of weights into those weight vests. See here the platform down onto the sea floor. And this is Sean. So as I mentioned before, Sean was a commercial diver. And this guy was an animal. For 16 days, he spent eight and a half hours on the sea floor every day. He was the first guy out and the last guy in and then tended all of our umbilicals, fixed them all, bungeed them up, and he was phenomenal. The EVA tool prep, we had rescue divers that brought down all of this staging area with all of our equipment for a given day, staged it on the seafloor, set it up before we set up 
packed up the nice little carts and then went off on our traverse down off the sea floor. During EDA, we had a lot of gear with us. So you can see here the trolley that's loaded up with equipment, the coral sampling tools, the reagents, and we had a tool belt with a hammer, all of the tags that we were gonna need, the EVA toolkit for testing different tools from the spacewalk department. Then we had a tablet that actually gave us access to all of our procedures and all of the other different components necessary. We had so many procedures, so many different tools that required a very set level of procedures and understanding that it had to be loaded onto tablets that we took with us and then the underwater navigation equipment. The underwater navigation equipment you can see here laid out kind of a kind of a template like this with the different gradients. You can see Aquarius up at the top there and then all of these different waypoints are laid out in different zones that allowed us to go and traverse. These different zones allowed you to go and zoom in on a given day and then follow a specific track through specific waypoints and then at each waypoint you were given your objectives to make sure that they could be ticked off accordingly to make sure the procedure was followed and all of the goals and objectives were met on that given day to the timeline. And we had the ability to go and map these out, change things accordingly and actually go and things were quite fluid but we also had a set of goals and objectives that had to be met on that given day before we came back in. Um, the underwater navigation system that we were using used a combination of Doppler, um, infrared and sonar and then we had a buoy here that actually connected us back in real time to the habitat which was pretty spectacular. It's hard to get um, communication or wireless communication like that underwater. I talked about the procedure so every single thing that we did underwater we used a procedure for. Now one of the biggest things with astronauts is they get bored easily. So you can't go and send an astronaut into a habitat like this and then send them out on a mission and say, turn over that fake rock. Tell me what that piece of rock looks like and report back. It just doesn't sustain them and it doesn't provide any value. One of the biggest things that we've done in the last couple of years is using coral as an analog for exogeology. So coral is the oxygen mask of the world's oceans. It provides the lifeblood of the oceans. However, one of the issues is over the last 10, 20 years, we've had climate change. The world's oceans are getting warmer. So the coral reefs in various places around the world, like the Great Barrier Reef, are dying off because they just can't sustain themselves and therefore the oceans are effectively dying. If all the coral dies, we're going to have a very serious problem as climate change really begins to take a hold. So one of the things that we've started doing with these missions is coral reef exploration, coral reef identification, working with FIU, working with the Coral Restoration Foundation to identify different genuses of coral that are actually thriving in some adverse conditions. Taking those samples, analyzing them, and then possibly doing genetic combination of different types of coral to try and come up with combinations that are more resistant to the change that we're seeing in the world's oceans and at the same time using those templates as an analog for exogeology. So how would we approach samples on an extraplanetary surface? What tools do we need? How do we make sure that we don't contaminate those samples? And all of these procedures kind of dial into those same components. One of the best things that we had was a training day where we got to go out down with the scientists from Florida International University, the Coral Specialist. And he was down beside us and he had his little clipboard and he went and he'd point to a piece of coral and say, Sidorastria. And then he'd go and point and he'd go and point to the coral and it's like, okay, that's that, we got it. Move along. Agarcia, okay, yeah, okay. That looks right. Great, fantastic. You've the subject matter expert bringing you down and giving you a guided tour. Fast forward a little bit and you're in a stainless steel helmet 20 meters deeper than you were previously and the coral changes and you can't see it correctly. Then they want you to go and do wordsmithing on Sidorastria, Agarcia, and Orbicella. And it just became ridiculous. One of the biggest issues that we had is we didn't have enough training. When you were with the expert and he was able to say, well, this is the three millimeter polyp, but I actually want you to go after the five millimeter polyp. It was almost impossible to see. So this became brain coral, carrot coral, cabbage coral, turnip coral, any other name that we could think of, not to have to say this humongous just list of wordsmithing. So as we went through, you can see that we went and dropped temporary markers on the different pieces of coral. 
the science team can actually see what we're looking at through the video. We're actually relaying it back to the habitat, to the aquanaut that's in there. But the other thing you have to remember is we're on 30 minute comm delay. They can't see what we're doing in real time. So what we have to do is go and find a different piece of coral that we think represented what the science team was looking for. Drop these temporary markers and then 30 minutes later we would actually go and get the feedback of go and get sample number 2, number 17 and number 21, forget the rest. So this was an interesting component of how do you deal with that time delay. We are not the subject matter experts. The astronauts are not geologists, they're not coral experts. But these are the operators on the ground that are required to go and take these samples. And so this allowed us to go and not only fine tune that procedure, the tools needed to retain the, um, I suppose, the sanctity of the sample to make sure that we didn't contaminate it, make sure we didn't contaminate ourselves, the vehicle, and so on, and all of the tools and procedures necessary. But this was relatively interesting and one of, by far one of the most interesting scientific objectives of the mission because it had real world application for what we were actually doing. Um, so how do you go and get a piece of coral out of the coral bed? Well, we had a hammer and chisel that didn't always work, so we had a drill. So you go and give an astronaut that's working in a stainless steel diving helmet, and then you have to tell him that he has to take a new big pneumatic drill and drill the sea floor. So needless to say, there was several volunteers who actually used the drill on a daily basis, and this was probably one of the funnest things that we got to do, that you would drill on the sea floor, da -da 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 -da, trying to go and get these samples out of the sea floor. One of the other big risks was if you go and broke off a massive piece of coral, um, it was like, don't do that. This is bad, we're trying to protect the coral. So we had rescue divers or technical divers that came along that I didn't realize afterwards that had this massive glue gun where we go and actually put the coral back, they re-glued the entire coral piece back on and then it would actually go and regrow and retake back to where it came off. The pantherometer was what we used to actually go and gauge the health. So this was a series of LEDs that would actually measure the health of the coral before we'd actually go and take a sample um, to actually get this. One of the most significant things that we actually did as part of this mission was building the world's deepest coral nursery. So you can see these coral trees that we actually built from hand on the seafloor. Each one contains about 200 pieces of coral and there are five coral trees in a row. We had to go build this component then photograph every single one of these small coral pieces. This time next year, or 12 months after this mission took place, is we'll go and actually take small snippets of those pieces of coral and they'll actually be taken and then be replanted on the coral reef. After about three years, that tiny little snippet of coral will actually be about 12 feet in diameter. So it actually grows very rapidly. One of the things that we're trying to do here is optimize the procedure and the template for actually regrowing coral and then applying it to different coral reefs around the world. And during this mission, um, I actually, so you have all this gear on your back, you're hunched over trying to put these together and seven and a half hours is a long time. So we actually radioed back and I tried to get somebody to actually get a hold of Guinness. I was like, if we're building, like bona fide building the world's deepest coral nursery as part of this mission, get somebody from Guinness on the phone to actually go and record this. I was like, this might be the one chance to get into the Guinness Book of World Records with this nonsense. So you can see here, just going and taking the photographs of the little coral samples um, one at a time. This was interesting. So as part of this mission, we actually brought down a small handheld manual um, drilling tool that was actually designed by students. So we brought this down with the idea that we would actually go and test this tool mm -hmm. and the whole concept was you would go and manually drill down into the regolith and then you would have a small detachable tool that you would actually go, could be taken out and another one dropped in. One of the biggest issues with trying to take samples and not contaminate them is that the regolith can get caught in the islet. The school that actually came up with this particular idea came up with a very unique eyelet that they developed using a modified bicycle tire and the spokes because the flexibility of that rubber would allow it to actually go and close around the regolith and force something either in or out so it could close completely and then retain the sample without actually contaminating it. One of the most interesting things about this is the spacewalking tools department 
We're so impressed by what these students brought to bear. It's actually going to be refined in conjunction with the students and we'll fly to either an asteroid, the moon or a future mission to Mars, which was pretty impressive. We're actually working at the moment and talking to Science Foundation Ireland to try and open up a pathway for both Irish schools, universities, students and researchers to be able to go and propose and enter into competitions like this and actually engage Irish science so much more with NASA on missions like this so they can actually see their technology, their experiments being used, liaise with the astronauts and actually see them being used and actually try to kickstart and inspire some of the work that's been done. One of the other experiments that we did was testing of optical comms equipment, testing small LED lights of different colors, different intensities at different distances to see what is the optimal way of actually transferring data underwater wirelessly without contact, which was pretty interesting. So you can just see the setup here that we had on the wet porch that was outside the Aquarius at the time. One of the aquanauts on board was the Naval Postgraduate School expert in oral V, remotely operated vehicle, and then AUV, autonomously underwater vehicles um, on Aquarius. So he'd been working with us for the last couple of years, and then during the mission, he went and guided these small autonomous rovers um, underwater and inspected some of the equipment, followed the aquanauts, provided additional viewpoints, retrieved some of the samples, brought them back to Aquarius, and so on. So this was pretty interesting from that point of view. A couple of missions ago, rather than the journey to Mars, we were working on an asteroid retrieval mission. So we actually brought in these mini one-man submersibles, which were designed to go and mimic one-man spacecraft. So what we do is, we go, the mini spacecraft or submersible would hover just above the seafloor, barely touching down, and then you had aquanauts that were on the end of a boom, effectively, trying to retrieve samples and testing how that would work, what we would need, because unlike a moon or a large body, these asteroids effectively are always slowly turning in space and to provide the ability to go and land these spacecraft without actually doing damage all at the one time was a significant objective and then you can see the support divers here tending the umbilicals and so on. So this was kind of cool just to see this in action. Down beside Aquarius we have a full scale mock-up of a lander that would either go to moon or possibly onto Mars at a future date. But what happens if we can't actually put astronauts on the floor of another planetary surface for whatever reason it might be? Well then using a boom was one of the options that had been proposed. So this was a lot of testing was done with lowering and um, upping this boom, actually working on the restraints, looking at how we would actually go and retrieve samples and just do a basic tool setup and traverse from one side to the other. The other thing that we have is we have an underwater climbing wall actually built on the sea floor at a 45 degree angle. So once again, looking at the application of boom technology, the restraints, what's comfortable, what kind of tools will we need, how do we make sure we don't contaminate the sample, retrieve it successfully, and then go and put all of these components together in an operational environment that's just not theoretical and figure out all of those kinks. And this is our change of command ceremony, so Reed Wiseman, transferring the Kirby Morgan um, to Megan. So this is the night before Reed and I um, effectively came up. So this was just a, a great photo, a phenomenal crew um, that we had together. And um, you can see here in the bunks, but facing all the way down into the galley area and the bulkhead that was actually sealed. So you can see actually the title in the book that we're actually reading. And um, these were contraband that were smuggled down. And um, it's 20,000 leagues under the sea. This actually turned out to be in 21 missions, the most popular photo in the history of the program. Um, so this went viral actually, uh, we took a little bit of heat for this, but it managed to raise the profile of everything that we were doing and uh, we took these home with us, which was pretty cool. One of the best things that we actually got to do was a night dive. Um, so that's myself and Reed outside with Matthias and Megan. Um, so we were outside for about an hour and one of the funnest things that I got to do in this mission and one of my best memories is getting inside and then we went and turned off the lights. So you're literally standing on the sea floor with nothing around you and then these green lights from the habitat turn on. And if you remember the scene from the first alien where they go and leave the Nostromo and come down and land on the planetary surface, that's literally all I could think of. 
you have this ship coming down, literally looks like steam, these green lights, and this literally looked like a spacecraft on the surface of another planet. We took about 40 photos that night, and this is the only one that ever came out clear. So Reed's pretty upset that he's the one that didn't get the, the clear flow photo as a result, but this was awesome just to see and experience this underwater. Talked a little bit about kind of the decompression or the recompression that we did on the O2 protocol. Here's the bunk and you can see the other bunk above me. That little cubby in the back there is effectively your living space. You had a small area to put all of your personal gear and then this is the space that we lived in. It was small but it was cozy. Um, but this was literally the adventure of a lifetime. Um, at Astra, for Astra, a rough road leads to the stars. It's a model that I've lived by. It's the model of my alma mater as well. Um, but this was the adventure of a lifetime. I got an extraordinary opportunity to do something pretty phenomenal. My crew members, um, Reed and Megan, would both say that this was the second best operational experience of their lives, surpassed by only going into space. And if that's all that this turns out to be, well then, this was a pretty phenomenal adventure that I got to be a part of. Thank you very much. second question in relation to cryogenics and um, there's actually been a lot of chatter in the last six to nine months of super cooling humans sinking their core body temperature and the requirements necessary for a deep sleep they still think that the technology that would be necessary to make that happen is probably at least 10 years off but it would seem to indicate that current research and steps have been taken now that by the time we get a crew ready to go to Mars, the possibility of 
six months or a longer duration of a, Cooper, of a super cool sleep might actually become a reality. So from my point of view, that's actually one of the most exciting areas that we're currently working on. And it also has application for conventional medicine and some disease processes that that will be able to help and we'll be able to investigate further. So I'm gonna keep a close eye on that. I, I can't wait to see how that aspect actually turns out. Yes, one further question, maybe someone else. I couldn't uh, really comprehend on the spaceship regarding uh, the, on the ISS, the, the visor 3D Microsoft thing. I recall watching a uh, program on Harlan and Wolf and the development of the, one of the engines for the Airbus, mm -hmm. and an engineer proudly displaying behind them a vast data bank of computers and telling us all that there was 600,000 parts, or maybe a million parts, but each one he could go to his laptop and have a signature and he'd just type it in and it would tell him everything he would need to know. But there didn't seem to be, in what you said, a similar feature where in an emergency or if you lost something and you needed information about something, there wasn't that fast gathering together center pool of information. So in relation to the supplies for the International Space Station, um, absolutely not. Um, they haven't done a good job of cataloging all of these components simply because up until now really, it's only in the last couple of years, everything has almost been maintenance on board the International Space Station, just getting it to the point where it's a functioning laboratory. And um, the individual components and systems are very well understood and very well maintained. It's the stuff on the inside where we've just been stowing stuff that people have not categorized correctly. Reed Wiseman, uh, my commander when he was on board the space station, one of the funniest things he ever said to me, he would go and spend, one of the most gratuitous things that he could do is he would go and spend his Sunday, he'd get about six hours, and he'd go into a compartment and he'd unpack the entire thing. And he'd go and categorize all the four layers of these hundreds of items categorize them, then put them back, and then go and send the list down to mission control. And he actually felt like he'd actually accomplished something. In relation to storage, that would be one aspect that they're trying to get on top of. The HoloLens is still very much almost a prototype technology. Microsoft's pushing it hard, but last year's Nemo mission was the first time that had been used in any kind of working capacity. Um, Scott Kelly actually flew it on board ISS um, at the end of his mission, just as a trial run. I think they're trying to compile that type of database for a variety of different functions and actually go and provide that ability using the HoloLens, but it's definitely not there yet. It's literally a crawl, walk, run approach of trying to actually go and manage those systems because you've got to remember you have components of American engineering, Russian engineering. They're well understood, but I don't think they have that level of what Airbus would have had with the individual parts. And again, you're, in, you're not in a hangar, you're in the most extreme environment that you could possibly think of, of trying to go and manage those. I think what we'll see is incorporating that technology possibly for future spacesuits, where you can actually go and actually build that into the visor, and then for next generation vehicles, as we kind of really push the engineering of space flight into the 21st century, those components might actually become more available to us. That would be cool. And won't it? So, there's a positive argument depending on what your objectives are. So what we use here is for training, adaptability, getting ready for space flight. I would love to see bigger habitats. One of the big issues that we have at the moment for Aquarius is maintenance. Um, NOAA used to own it. They sold it for a minimal amount of money to Florida International University because it was actually taken out of the budget. They were actually going to go and scupper Aquarius on the seafloor, flood it, and just leave it to the fishes. So, would it be cool? Absolutely. The problem is who's going to pay for it? One of the big reasons that Aquarius is at the depth that it is at 20 meters is that most people don't realize that oxygen is actually toxic to the human body at pressure. So if you go too deep on too much oxygen, you actually get toxicity of the central nervous system. It can cause seizures. 
a little bit shallower but a longer period of time you can get pulmonary toxicity where you develop a dry racking cough within the lungs that can then eventually begin to cause bloody frothy sputum and actually get fluid in the lungs. The depth to actually cause that pulmonary toxicity of increased oxygen in the system is actually at about 55 feet. That's one of the reasons that the living depth of Aquarius is actually 45 feet. So we can actually live at that 45 feet level indefinitely without the toxic effects of oxygen built in. So Aquarius is actually staged on the sea floor in a sandy kind of basin surrounded by coral but on a very very stable platform at a specific depth to make sure that all of the toxic and dangerous effects that we would see from living under pressure and underwater won't be experienced. To have a long term or much larger habitat it would either need to be maintained at the same pressure as the surface or built in a similar type of environment to make sure that kind of human beings don't suffer similar type of toxic effects over a much longer period of time. So one of the biggest things, and it's more akin to spacewalks we're doing at the moment, and I'll come back to Nemo in a second. In the neutral buoyancy lab, you saw Paolo Naspali um, being trained in the big white suit underwater. So they keep that as close to simulation and training quality for actual spacewalks as they can for outside of the International Space Station. And they go and they'll train. So for every hour that they do on a spacewalk, outside they spend somewhere between six to ten hours depending on the mission in the pool at the MBL and the whole idea is that they'll go in the same way they go out the airlock the same way hands go in the same way and um, the astronauts would say that the level of training that that provides in specific tasks is very much akin to what they do because they have the same tools with the same bag and so on oh yeah protocol procedure one of the biggest things that um, they would say, however, and one of the big differences, when you're underwater in the pool, the astronauts will go and they're toggled with two different tethers onto the outside of the space station. They'll go and they'll push off and then the tether gets them and they're over this handhold and they're getting their tools. And Reed said the second time that he was in the pool, the trainer that was with him afterwards told him, you won't do that on space. And he's like, listen, I'm tethered in. I'll be looking around. I'll be looking at the view. And... We said going out of the airlock and um, the very first time that he did a spacewalk you crawl outside and there's nothing but down and he says you're hanging on the outside of this ship that's going 26,000 kilometers per hour looking down at the earth and he says you're dead right you go and you hang on for dear life because the last thing you're going to do is push off and risk any kind of maneuver he says it's just the feeling of height is overwhelming once you're hanging around on the outside and he said once you go and open that airlock he says just that sense of depth and height because the airlock goes and it's facing down and it flips open and he said that was the most significant aspect he says it's amazing the view is incredible especially what Kate Nivens did on this last and space walk 